Mio Senchim Anyavu. May the Creator bless you all. Welcome. My name is Ramona Beltran. I'm an associate professor here in the Graduate School of Social Work at University of Denver. My family is Yaqui and Mexica descendant, originally from Northern Mexico on my mother's side, Anglo-European descent on my father's side. Um, and I was taught to acknowledge all of my ancestors because no matter where I am sitting or standing, it is upon their shoulders. Um, and in that spirit, I want to take this moment to acknowledge the original people of the land upon which University of Denver stands. Um, I honor and acknowledge the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, and all of the other original indigenous peoples who have called this place their home. I want to express our deepest gratitude from the Graduate School of Social Work for Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer joining us today. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have ever had a book that you carry around with you everywhere you go, because you think if you just hold it or you have it with you, somehow its knowledge and wisdom will just kind of seep into your being. Well, that's my experience with Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, it's one of those um, books that I've cherished and carried with me and it's taught me so much, it's validated so much of my experience, and it's been a source of connection with community and other people who have felt the same way about this book. And there's so much knowledge that uh, Dr. Kim Rur keeps or shares with us within the pages of this book, but we are so blessed today that she's gonna take us outside of those pages and be with us in person. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce her. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants and Gathering Moss, a Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. She lives in Syracuse, Syracuse, New York, where she is a SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. So without much further to do, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kim Rur to join us today. Thank you. Yeah, I think we were working at cross purposes. Ani bojo in dinwe maganadok. Shabadas ke gish kokwe na deshnakas. Bodwe wad me kwenda. Megazedo dem minwa moko do dem. Syracuse, New York, na dutch bia me kwech kenke koko mi jang. And in our beautiful Potawatomi language, I, I give you greetings, tell you that I am a member of the citizen Potawatomi nation of the Bear Clan and also of the Eagles. I'm speaking to you today from Syracuse, New York, and I am so grateful to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you, Ramona, for that very kind introduction. We spend so much time looking at our screens that I want to invite our plant and animal relatives to join. So let me share some slides with us. There we go. Okay, um, great, let's get them moving here. There we are, all right. It is also part of our traditional protocol that we always begin with gratitude. And so I say miigwech to all of us as, as people for the privilege of being in one another's company for this beautiful day that we are whole and healthy and surrounded by the companionship of our more than human kin. I also want to hmm, give gratitude to the Onondaga people in whose homelands I live. When we give gratitude for the gifts of the earth, it feels to me like we are creating this basket full of berries, full of the, full of the gifts of, of Mother Earth. And much of the society that we live in views these everyday miracles, like a basket of blackberries, as natural resources, as if they were somehow our property, just waiting to be transformed. 
In the ecological sciences, we call them sometimes ecosystem services, as if they were the inevitable outcomes of, of the ecological machine. But traditional people refer, refer to the berries as gifts. And in fact, in the Potawatomi language, the root word for berry and the root word for gift are the same. And this thinking about the world as full of gifts, as a big basket of berries, calls me to remember that here in upstate New York is also the treaty area of Nagan Gebejik Emkwan, which means the dish with one spoon treaty belt. And this treaty belt is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee people in whose territory I live today and the Anishinaabe people of whom the Potawatomi are, are a member. And this is, I think, the oldest conservation and sustainable sustainability policy on Turtle Island. This belt tells us that the land that Mother Earth provides for us as a dish with one spoon, like that basket full of berries, that the earth provides for us, but that that bowl is finite. When it's empty, it's empty. And our job as human people is to keep it full and overflowing so that all might be fed to keep that bowl clean. The treaty belt also tells us that there is one spoon. This is a message of sharing, a message of justice. There is one spoon for all of us to take from the bowl that Mother Earth fills, not a big one for some and a small one for others. It is a policy of sharing for the living gifts of the world. And when we give gratitude for all of these gifts with which we are simply showered every single day, it strikes me as so strange that while we are showered with gifts, we live in a society that is relentlessly asking, what more can we take from the earth? Whereas I think the question, especially on Earth Day, must be, what does the earth ask of us? What is it that we human people have to give, to share, to keep that bowl full? And it is this question that will structure my, my remarks and our discussion this afternoon. But I couldn't begin without also honoring my teacher. You see here a photograph of Wingashk, as we call her in our language, sweetgrass, um, the beautiful braids. And we braid sweetgrass because we understand in our creation stories that sweetgrass is the hair of Mother Earth. And so we braid her hair just as we braid one another's as a tangible sign of our care for her beauty and for her well being. There are many, many teachings about the braids of sweetgrass. But for me, and in the book Braiding Sweetgrass, they are three strands of knowledge that are braided together in order to think about how we care for Mother Earth. A braid of traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous science, a braid of a strand of Western scientific knowledge, because I'm trained as a, as a plant ecologist and botanist as well. But you know, both of those ways of knowing are human ways. The third strand for me in this teaching braid is the knowledge of the plants themselves. And the relationship between these three ways of knowing traditional knowledge, scientific knowledge, and the knowledge of plants has not always been an easy relationship for me. And because I know this is largely an audience of students, I want to tell you just a brief story of my time as a student. In September, when I went away to college to study botany, because indeed I had been born a botanist and, and uh, I knew that the plants were going to uh, guide me for the rest of my life. I also knew that in going to a forestry school, I would be one of the only women on the campus and I would certainly be the only native person on campus. And so 
I wanted to be very well prepared for my intake freshman interview, which I knew was to happen on, on day one. So when my professor said to me, so Miss Wall, why do you want to study botany? I was ready. I said, I want to know why goldenrod and asters look so beautiful together. And don't they? That purple and, and gold, they could grow on opposite sides of the field, but they don't. They grow intermingled with one another in this spectacular display. And I thought it was a good question. But he said to me, Miss Wall, that is not science. Botanists do not concern themselves with beauty. If you wanted to study beauty, you should have gone to art school. And so steeped in traditional knowledge, I tried again. And I said, I also want to know why they make medicine and why some bend for baskets and others don't. And he swept it all away and said, no, that is, that is not science. That's not botany. That's not what we do here, but you take my botany classes and then you'll learn what it is. And that is why I looked so happy in my freshman intake photo from that very day where I received the message that my ways of knowing, my understanding of plants as companions and teachers was not welcome. But I had no vocabulary of resistance. I didn't, I thought I must be wrong. After all, he was the authority. He was the botany professor. And so I prepared myself to listen and to learn, all the while knowing that my first day at the university was not unlike my grandfather's first day at the Carlisle Indian School, whose motto, as you may remember, was to kill the Indian to save the man. He as a little boy of only nine years old, taken from his family, put on the train to Carlisle. He too was told that his way of knowing had no place in the world that, that he was entering. I have felt the echo of that experience my whole life because I had unwittingly stepped into another worldview. I'd grown up in the indigenous paradigm where nature was subject, where the plants were understood as my relatives, as, 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 as teachers, as, as sovereign persons and beings. And I had walked into an environment in which they were objects, in which they were specimens. And instead of thinking about the ecosystem as a, as a community of, of beings, the dominant metaphor was, was the ecosystem as a machine in which human beings were in charge. You know, it makes me wonder, how did we get so far away from our understanding of the kinship with the living world? And it seems to me that for the past couple of centuries, which is really just an eye blink of, of time in the lifetime of our species, it's as if we've been doing an unintended experiment that has very tangible outcomes. We've unwittingly asked what would happen if we believed in this pyramid of human exceptionalism? What if a single species out of the millions who inhabit the planet was somehow more deserving of all the riches of the earth than any other. And not only that in this experiment, all of the ecological laws that constrain growth and limit consumption do not apply to us, not to our species, but the laws of thermodynamics had been repealed just on our behalf. And this experiment tests the hypothesis of what would happen if we behaved as if the earth was nothing more than stuff, this strictly materialist reductionist view of the earth, and moreover, that all that stuff belonged to us? Well, we know that the results of that experiment are in. We find ourselves teetering at the edge of the precipice of climate catastrophe. We have entered what biologists are calling the age of the sixth extinction, in which we are losing 200 species every day. In this world, how do we answer what does the earth ask of us? The earth asks us to change. And yet so much of our environmental discourse around sustainability 
is all about changing technology. It's about changing light bulbs. And, and, and don't get me wrong, every new technology and innovation is going to be important and welcome in this uphill climb that we have to, to, to right the, the, the atmosphere, to right the climate. But as a scientist, I don't think it's just new technology that, that we need. If we are to survive, and if our more than human relatives are to survive as well, we need to change more than light bulbs. We need a change in worldview. From a worldview that thinks about land as, as property, as natural resources, as capital, as ecosystem services, um, this notion of property, that we can claim property, exclusive rights to the fate of, of land. The change that we need is to the organic indigenous worldview in which we understand land as a source of our identity, land as our sustainer, the ones who take care of us. It is the residence of our more than human relatives as well as ourselves. The land is our ancestral connection, both to the ancestors who led us here and to our own descendants to whom we must pass this land on. Land understood as a source of knowledge, as, as the library, as, as the teacher, as the pharmacy and the healer, because the land because the land is our home, because the land is not the place for which we claim rights, but for the place where we accept and celebrate our responsibility, our moral responsibility to life is enacted on the land. <coughs> Excuse me. Because the land is sacred. I think that we are living in an era of profound error. For much of human's time on the planet, before this great delusion of exceptionalism, we lived in cultures that understood ourselves not as masters of the universe, but as the younger brothers of creation. And the Western scientific worldview that has so dominated our landscape like a monoculture for the past 500 years has yielded tremendous gains in the quality of human life without question. It's brought us huge advances in knowledge, but it's not more knowledge that we need at this moment. It's, it's wisdom. As, and as we see in the wisdom of this medicine wheel, generating wisdom is not within the purview of science alone. We need a science that draws, yes, on the intellect, yes, on the senses, but also on emotion and, and spirit a kind of a science which acknowledges the recognition that we humans are not atop a pyramid of life, but are a member of a kinship network governed by laws of interdependence. At this time that you and I are living in right now, of great change and great choices has been spoken of by our ancestors in the teachings of the prophecies of the people of the seventh fire. It's a long story, a long history, um, and an important one. And I can share just a tiny little fragment of it today. These seven fires refer to different periods in the history of our people from long before the time that uh, settlement occurred, but warned of the consequences of that settlement. It begins with the first fire with our people at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, living with our Wabanaki relatives. But a teacher came among the people who warned of changes that were coming to Turtle Island and told the people to divide and some to move to the West to protect the sacred fire. And the seven fires tells of that movement through history over the land and those things which befell us after the arrival of the newcomers, after all of the losses of colonization and attempted genocide. It speaks in the various fires of the losses of land, of language, of sacred ways, of each other. And it is said that there will come a time when 
the people on, on Turtle Island find that they can no longer dip their cup into a stream and, and, and drink. And when the air is too thick to breathe and the plants and animals start to turn their faces away from us. And it is said in that time, we will know it is the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, our elders tell us that all the world's people are going to be standing at a fork in the road, a choice point. And in my imagination, one of those paths is soft and green and all spangled with dew. You could walk barefoot there. And one of the paths is black and burnt. It's made out of cinders and to walk there would cut your feet. The prophecy tells us that we have to make a choice between the path of materialism and greed that will destroy the earth or the spiritual path of care and compassion of bemudziwin, of the good life in, in balance. And of course we know what path we want to take, but the teachers tell us that we can't just all go walking down that, that green path that the people of the seventh fire are instead called to turn around and walk back along that ancestor's path and pick up what was taken from us along the way, pick up what was left by the, the, the trail, the stories, the teachings, the songs, each other are more than human relatives and our language. And only when we have found these once again and placed them in our bundles, those things that will heal us, can we walk forward on that green path? And these are the questions that we face at this fork in the road. What do we find along the ancestors path that will heal us and bring us back into balance? What do we love too much to lose to climate change? that we will carry it safely through the narrows, safely to the other side. Because the teachers tell us that there is another side. The people of the seventh fire, that's you and that's me, will need great courage, imagination, wisdom and creativity, but we will pick up what we need and it will lead us to lighting the eighth fire the fire of the continuity of life on this beautiful planet. Faced with the problems that we face to know those teachings, to have the courage to go forward toward that green path. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> I long for a teacher. I wish I had a, a wise grandma who could guide us in this perilous time to find that right path. And in our teachings, it's said that Sky Woman, our first woman, went back to the sky and she looks over all of us with the face of, of Grandmother Moon and that she left our teachers behind us, the ones that she brought to us, the plants. And in many indigenous traditions, my own among them, plants are not only understood as persons, but as among our oldest teachers. They've been on earth far longer than any of us. They embody the virtues that we honor of, of, of generosity. Who better to look to for guidance than those who can take light and air and water and turn it into food and medicine and give them away for free? We might well look to them for guidance. And when I'm wrestling with any question, I often go to the plants for counsel to see what they have to say about it. And what if you were a great teacher, if you had great knowledge, but had no voice to speak it and no pen to write it, and yet there was something that you needed to say? Plants tell their stories not by what they say, but by what they do. And the plants in uh, the Potawatomi language um, are known as mishkikin. And mishkikin, when you take that word apart, it, it means medicine. But the word itself in its components means the strength of the earth. It tells us that healing comes 
from the strength of the earth, from the plants. And in this year, which is the warmest ever recorded, when the glaciers are melting, storms are rising, and hundreds of our fellow species are in grave danger, it's important to remember that we don't have to figure our way out of this dilemma alone. We have our teachers. In the indigenous paradigm, knowledge arises from multiple sources. And one of them is learning from the land by listening to intelligences other than our own. And this is grounded in the understanding of the personhood of all beings and the intelligence of nature. In forward thinking scientists, some at your own university, I'm sure, have a parallel so-called new area of study based on accessing the intelligence of nature for design, for engineering, for environmental problem solving. This new discipline of biomimicry, the notion that we could learn from the living world, how nature has evolved solutions to life. Predictably, this science of biomimicry has for so far been primarily restricted to learning what new products might be made, what new commodities. But what interests me is what they might teach us about how we could live. If plants are our teachers in this time of great crisis, what could they teach us about responses to climate change if we were willing to listen and learn? because plants know what to do about climate change. They don't dither in ineffectual meetings and debate carbon tax structures endlessly. They just get to work. They can be a model for the transformation that we need. I mean, think about it. They have already converted to a 100% solar economy. And you have probably heard that Richard Branson has established the Virgin Earth Challenge to spur the design of new technologies that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it while we are transforming to a fossil fuel economy. It's a lofty goal, critical deployment of, of, of human intellect on behalf of the climate, and the prize is $25 million. And human ingenuity will be part of the solution. But we should keep in mind that we don't necessarily need a factory to, to do this. There already is a system that pulls carbon from the atmosphere and stores it for centuries. And it has even more bells and whistles. It generates oxygen. It builds soil. It builds biodiversity. It purifies water. and it makes us feel happy and peaceful. And it's called a forest. I say, give the prize and more to the trees. Because plants don't put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Of course, they take it out and sequester it in long-term storage, in the bodies of tree trunks, in 12-foot deep roots of prairie grass, and in the bogs of peat and the organic matter of rich, fertile soils. Because after all, what are coal and oil but the stored carbon of prehistoric plants? And the plants stored away all of that carbon, kept it out of the atmosphere until we decided to rip open the earth and burn up eons of stored fossil fuel in just a few centuries. Plants have been sequestering carbon since the beginning, removing it from the air. Let's follow their lead and join the movement to keep it in the ground. Plants as our teachers, how do they teach us by what they do? What do they do when the climate changes? They grow faster when there's more carbon dioxide through the so-called CO2 fertilization effect. But as hard as they might try, they then run up against other limiting factors like water and nutrients, and they soon run out of other things which are in ever shorter supply. 
but the plants aren't degrading the soil, they are building it. Plants don't degrade the water, they purify it. And when we stand in a shower of spring rain, as we can this April, we have the plants to thank for that. Cut down enough forests and the rain disappears, just as is happening in the Amazon basin today. Plants save the water. And as the world heats up, who is it that creates oases of shade? Who cools our city's urban heat islands? Doing sophisticated air conditioning without using a single watt of electricity. Plants don't ruin the land, they heal it. They are our teachers of restoration. We could do worse than to engage the traditional indigenous philosophy of listening to the plants. And many of our climate solutions, which are based on changes in policy, in technology, as well they should be, we have to also equally invest very strongly in nature's inherent capacity to store carbon. So halting deforestation, accelerating afforestation, Ecological restoration is a huge piece of this, especially in wetlands, protecting wetlands and their ability to sequester carbon while regulating climate and the hydrologic cycle. Regenerative agriculture, biodiversity protection, all of, the <coughs> excuse me, all of these things are part of what are called the natural or nature-based solutions which can be part of, of the solutions that we, that we face, but a part of the solutions to the crises that we face. But in fact, we know from climate models that it's, it's not enough. Um, the models suggest that we are likely far past the point when we can rely on entirely on nature, natural solutions to reestablish carbon dioxide balance, even if we could and we must protect and in invigorate them. We've simply added way too much carbon to the atmosphere, cut down too many forests. In a sense, we have crippled the Earth's ability to respond. The plants can't do this alone, and they, they, they need us um, to help. So all of our action in terms of systems change to shut down damaging fossil fuel economies, to stand up for nature-based solutions, to stand up for climate justice, all of this is our work in return for the gifts that the plants have given us. This is what the earth asks of us. Raise good kids, raise a garden, raise a ruckus in, in reciprocity for the gifts of the living world. In this time, if we take seriously this notion that plants can be our teachers in a time of climate change, we should be asking ourselves, how can we be better students. Let's think about that together. Always the answer when we say, how can we be better students is, is to pay attention. And ethnobotanists tell us that our great grandparents knew well over 100 plants by name and, and, and by use. And our ancestors, of course, knew many, many more. Of course they did because they grew them in their gardens and harvested them in, in the woods. They lived in a time when people understood that food doesn't come from a store. But today it is said that we suffer from plant blindness because the average American can identify a hundred different corporate logos and only 10 plants. Our attention has been hijacked by this pyramid of human exceptionalism and by the pathway of materialism and, and greed. Recognize 10 plants and you know what? On that list, one of the plants that's on that list is Christmas tree. So I think that's really only, only nine. Failing to know our plant relatives, is it any wonder that we live in a society that recognizes legal personhood for corporations and no legal standing at all for aspen trees or for blue jays? 
Knowing the beings with whom we share the earth is a pathway to the recognition of the world as gift. The world seems so much less like a shopping bag full of commodities and more like a gift. When you know the one who's caring for you, the one who gives you aspirin for your headache, her name is Willow. She lives up by the pond, doesn't she? And she's a neighbor to Maple um, who gives us syrup for our, our Sunday morning pancakes. Paying attention is a pathway to gratitude and to reciprocity. And naming plants is not just a matter of respect. It can be a powerful tool for transformation because recognition of the personhood of all beings opens the door to ecological justice. And the laws that we have in this country today are all about governing our rights to land as land as property. And the shift that we need is to include the rights of the land, the rights of the land to be whole and healthy and to simply exist. If we engage our indigenous teachings, which regard all living beings as persons, we can follow the lead of our Maori brothers and sisters who have worked to have their sacred river recognized as a legal person or to the indigenous led nations of Ecuador and Bolivia who have enshrined the rights of nature in their constitutions. To the global movement, again, led by this indigenous philosophy of the personhood of nature to the declaration, the UN declaration on the rights of mother earth, which is currently before the United Nations. Recognition of personhood takes place not just in international courts, but also in our minds and in our everyday speech. Let's spend some time thinking about personhood in the way that we speak and therefore in the way that we think. Most of us speak English, our native language is in many cases nearly lost through assimilation and linguistic imperialism. It's really exciting to me to, to see how many languages are, are being revitalized and, and, and used again. And to my mind, one of the most egregious losses in linguistic imperialism and the replacement of indigenous languages with English is captured in this single little word of it. In English grammar, we refer to our family members and our fellow humans with the grammar of personhood, don't we? We say he or she, never it. We would never say of our beloved grandmother, look, it's making soup. And yet that is exactly how we speak of our beloved grandmother, the earth. To refer to a human being as it is deeply disrespectful. It robs one of personhood and kinship and reduces one to a thing. And in English, a being is either a person or a thing. We are given no other way to refer to non-human beings, this butterfly, this robin, this bear, this, this bloodroot, than as it, objectifying nature, which opens the door to exploitation. Linguistics codes for our relationships with the world, delineating the boundaries of our circles of, of compassion and respect. And when a maple tree is necessarily referred to as it, we can easily take up the chainsaw. But when maple tree is a her, we have to think twice. And in the Potawatomi language, and indeed in many other indigenous languages, there is no it for birds or for berries. The language doesn't divide the world into him or her, but into animate and inanimate. And the grammar of animacy is applied to all that lives, to sturgeon and mayflies and blueberries and boulders and rivers. 
we refer to other members of the living world with the same grammar that we use for our family because it's our family. If we are to survive here, if our plant and animal relatives are to survive here too, we need to learn to speak the grammar of animacy. As we reclaim our, our languages, we also reclaim respectful relationship with the earth. And so I have made a modest proposal, which I'll share with you as a, as a thought and linguistic experiment of thinking of how might we be able to reclaim a grammar of respect and animacy for the living world with new pronouns so that we don't say it, so that we don't objectify our more than human relatives. To make a, a long journey short, um, what I'll share with you is this pronoun, he. Ki comes from that little sound at the end of the Potomotomy word, aki, the earth, which is at the end of a phrase, bamadizi aki, which refers to living beings of the earth. Could we say of those maples, not it, I'm going to go drill it for syrup, for sap, but that ki is giving us a gift this spring. We slide ki right into next to he, she, ki, and it so that we have an alternative to speak respectfully of living beings. We're still gonna need it for paper clips and, and bulldozers and real objects, but not our relatives. Of course, we're going to need a plural term as, as well. And all we have to do is reclaim our English term, add an N to key, and we get kin a word that reminds us, that invites us into a respectful, reciprocal relationship with our relatives, not as object, but as subject. Indigenous languages have tremendous power. I share with you this one um, example from um, uh, uh, Giselle Maria Martin, who says in her language, the word for tree literally means the holders of land, the land holders. Do you think that we would go clear cutting steep slopes if we called the beings who were taken land holders? Indigenous languages are a pathway to topple human exceptionalism and invite us once again as members of the democracy of species. I want to turn again to this question of what does the earth ask of us as the earth calls us to reciprocity and what will we give in return for the gifts of the earth. This last teaching that I can share this afternoon is a teaching called the honorable harvest. In a sense, this is a code of ethics that guides how we take from the earth when we understand the earth to be our relatives. Because if you think about the earth as just stuff, <coughs> as it, you can take any way you want. It's just stuff. But if the earth is made up of your relatives, of persons, you have to take very mindfully in a way that honors the lives that are given to you. And this is the code of ethics known as the honorable harvest. They're simultaneously biophysical and spiritual. And in the indigenous worldview, these two ways of being are mutually reinforcing. And the guidelines for the honorable harvest were taught to me by generous teachers um, in picking medicines and, and picking berries, but it applies to every single exchange between people and, and the earth. Whether we're picking berries, going fishing, cutting firewood, or buying a cell phone, the honorable harvest, this ancient ethical protocol can apply to every single exchange between people in the earth. It's not generally written down, but if it was, it would look like this. 
if we're going berry picking, when you get to the woods, you don't start gathering everything all at once. We're taught to never take the first one. And never taking the first means that you'll never take the last. This is a prescription that has inherent conservation value through the practice of self-restraint. And then if you encounter a second one, um, I've been taught to address that plant, to ask permission, to introduce myself, give greetings and thanks, and to explain why I need those berries or, or, or roots. Because if you're going to take a life, you have to be accountable to that, to that one who's giving you their, their life. And I know there are places where you'd think that you would call a person crazy to ask permission of a plant to pick berries, but in a worldview that re regards them as people, um, we just call it respect. It's a two-way conversation though. If you're going to ask, you have to listen for the answer. And you can listen in different ways. You can look around, see whether the plants are numerous enough and healthy enough, whether they have enough to share. You can listen for the answer with the tools of environmental science and plant ecology. You can listen for the answer intuitively. Either way you do it, if the answer is no, you go home because we remember that they don't belong to us. Taking without permission is also known as stealing. And we have been stealing from Shkak Mikwe, from Mother Earth. If you are granted permission, take only what you need and no more. This is a difficult step in our materialist affluence plagued society. And the difference between needs and wants are intentionally blurred um, by marketers. We're in court, encouraged to take everything that we can get. The honorable harvest counsels that we take in such a way that does the least harm and in a way that benefits the, the land. Don't use a shovel if a, a digging stick will do. And the protocol continues to say, use everything that you take. It's a disrespectful of the life that was given to you to waste it. And we forget that the easiest way to have what you need is not to waste what you already have. And be grateful, grateful for what you have received. In an economy which relentlessly urges you to want more, the practice of gratitude is truly a radical act. Thankfulness for everything that you have makes you feel rich beyond measure, and it makes you know that wealth is counted as having enough to share. And gratitude is humbling. It's an antidote to the arrogance of our time. It reminds us that we are one member of the web. It reminds us that the earth doesn't belong to us. And the next tenet is to share. Share it with others, whatever you take. Bring those berries to a neighbor down the road who couldn't go pick them. Leave some there for the turtles and, and, and the blue jays. The earth is generous with us and we must model that generosity in return. A culture of sharing is a culture of resilience. And lastly, almost lastly, we know that in order for balance to occur, we can't take without giving back. And gatherers often leave a spiritual gift behind, but also a material gift through the act maybe of weeding or spreading seeds, um, uh, breaking up rhizomes and planting them. You have to know what those plants need in order to help them flourish. We give care, we give gratitude, we give ceremony, we give our attention, we give our respect. It's a way that we answer the question, what does the earth ask of us? And I am told that there is a teaching even older then take only what you need. And that is, take only that which is given to you. It's a very challenging ethical and ecological concept to be able to, to, to discern what is given to us as opposed to what we take under duress. And I've wrestled with this concept. I certainly don't have full understanding of it, but I do know that coal from mountaintop removal is not given to us.
Tar sands oil that destroy the land is not given to us. Shale gas from hydrofracking that poisons water is clearly not given to us. But the sun's energy is given to us every day. Every day the wind blows, the surf rolls without impediment. These are given to us freely and limitless in supply, although not without their own costs of which we must be deepful, deeply mindful and respective. respectful. Take only that which is given us as a key part of a sustainable energy policy. Had we lived by the honorable harvest, had we taken only that which is given to us, perhaps we would today not be afraid of our own atmosphere. Can we extend the concepts of the honorable harvest, of the personhood of nature to address the environmental dilemmas that we face today? We need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, we need restoration of honor to the way that we live. And the reward is, is not just a, a feel good sense of responsibility. It may save our lives and the lives of our relatives. Our economies and our institutions enmesh us all in a profoundly dishonorable harvest. And collectively by our ascent or by inaction, we have chosen the policies we live by. And we can choose again. We must choose again. We can choose reciprocity to sustain the lives that sustain our own. This is the teaching of the plants. Mi iu, mi gwech pizindawieg, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmerer. There um, are a number of questions, um, and I know we won't have time. We all knew that this hour is was going to go fast. Um, so, but before I get to the questions, I wanted to circle back to gratitude as you began. Um, so I reached out to the interwebs, to social media um, in preparation for this uh, gathering. And I asked folks if uh, you have read Braiding Sweetgrass or have been impacted by Dr. Kimmerer's work in any way, can you please share how in the comments? You could share a few words or moments that inspired you, what you learned and or what you would like to thank her for. And so I'd like to take this moment to offer you this gift of gratitude. Oh, thank you. An offering to Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, a crowdsourced poem. And I'm going, to sh I'm going to send along all of the comments as well so you can reflect on those. But here we go. You hold this end steady as we begin to braid over, under, around. Scientific inquiry and the natural world, a renewed sense of wonder. The color of asters attract bees and pollinators, fertility, generativity for all of us, a question to take seriously. Cleaning the pond a mother's work, dedication, the invisible tender care of parenthood, a web to nourish without constricting freedom, over, under, around. Reconnecting with intention, indigenous roots, roots to place, we greet our plant relatives because the land knows you even when you are lost. Sap from the copal tree, cleansing smoke and beads, penguin memories, reminding the fish to also say thank you, on the bay of a repatriated island, the land knows its way home too. Over, under, around. Savoring kinship, connection, strawberries, weeds, wild skunk cabbages, tatanka, buffalo, algae, so much algae. Black ash, sweet grass, sweet syrup, turtles sunning themselves on the rocks. Sometimes we wish we could photosynthesize so that just by being, just by shimmering, floating, we could be doing the work of the world while standing silent in the sun. Ceremony, ritual, transformation, 
a gift received, many gifts then given and given again, it always moves in circles, over, under, around. The grammar of animacy, we need a new pronoun. For the natural environment, as always, nature teaches us to be more sophisticated, compassionate, to push the limits of spoken language, renaming for essence, to build a relation, reverence for the ancient past, the potential for a more connected future, make the unfelt felt. Back to the pond we go, digging, cleaning, healing, breathing, slow, steady. As teachers, students, fibers, soil, seeds germinating, rebirthing, reaching to the sun, over, under, around. Thank you for all of this. Yosem Chiokwe Utesia. I hardly have words. <laughs> Thank you. That is so beautiful. Thank you to everyone who braided their thoughts together. And, and that gift does braid us all together, doesn't it? Um, and, and, and that's what we so much need to do this work in the world is to feel each other's love for the world and know that every one of us is, is, is participating in that, in that gift. So thank you. That is for me a, a great healing gift. I, I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you. My absolute honor to carry those words of all of the people who contributed that represent all of the lives that you've told, or just a portion of the lives that you have touched. There are so many questions now. <laughs> well, a lot of gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, Yes, a lot of thank you for your inspirational words. Maybe it's one o'clock right now. You probably have to jump off. But if we have one minute for maybe. Sure, sure. Quick. I can stay for a couple of minutes. If, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I will start from the beginning and I'm going to reword this just a little bit, Brenda, because I, I want to make sure that we can speak to as many people as possible. So Brenda Gillen asks, um, how can non-Native folks uh, utilize and implement traditional knowledge uh, without being considering being considered as appropriating culture or cultural knowledge. Yes, um, I appreciate that question very much, and and traditional the kind of traditional knowledge and relationships with land that I'm talking about do not come with a chromosome. They come with relationship with the earth, with listening to the earth, with being, with coming into reciprocity with, with the earth. And, you know, I once had someone say to me, you know, I want to be grateful to the earth too, but I don't want to culturally appropriate, of course. And to take someone else's way of being grateful for the earth is, is cultural appropriation that is to be avoided, right? And not, you know, we don't, we don't go there, but does that mean that as a settler, you can't be grateful for the earth? Of course not. The, the land feeds you, the, the, the river gives you a drink, of course you're grateful. And the key is to express that in an authentic way, um, in your way. Um, to borrow somebody else's ways of being does not have the power or the agency of the word of what comes from your heart. Um, so authentic engagement with the living world, develop your knowledge and relationship with the living world is the invitation here um, to become rooted in place, to live here as if it was your ancestral home. Um, not to take from, from others, but to dig deep in yourself and create that authentic relationship. Thank you. And we'll just close with this last one. Since we are here at the Graduate School of Social Work, what do you see as the role of social workers in this effort towards reclaiming relationship with the earth in our practices? What a wonderful question. And, and I, I would love to hear how social workers consider this so that we can ally ourselves in, in this work. But to me, the, the notion of human well being is inseparable from the well being of the land. Um, and that when we talk about land as medicine, land as the healer, that, that, 
there's so much wisdom in that word mushkikin, that it's the strength of the earth. Helping people connect to that medicine of, of the earth takes so many forms. You know, I think about the movement for tree justice, for example, that when, you know, we all need access to the healing powers and the restorative powers of nature, it, we, we, it is tied up with justice. We can't just have beautiful green parks and trees and affluent neighborhoods and, and, and other people don't get it. No, I think that, that, that our well-being is connected to the well-being of the land and our ability to connect. Um, and so I, I would relish the opportunity to learn from you about the way that your profession can help um, reinvigorate those connections for healing for land and for people. That is a perfect invitation for us to be in more conversation across disciplines and across communities. And with that, I just want to express my deep gratitude again, Dr. Kimmer, Robin, if I may, um, just for your time and everything that you brought today. I know I was soaking it all in. And what I see here in the Q&A box is just so much expression of gratitude for your message in this very moment when we need it the most. My apologies to everybody that I couldn't get your, your question in, but thank you for being with us this hour. And um, hoping and praying that you all go with grace and goodness and enjoy the rest of, well, it's a beautiful day here in Denver, well, the, rest, the rest of the beautiful springtime that we have here in front of us. And with that, I'll close with saying, thank you so much. Miigwech.